It's my honor to uh, introduce Dr. Andrew Larson. Uh, Andrew is a professor in the Department of Forest Management at the University of Montana and has earned uh, bachelor's of science and PhD degrees in forest resources from the University of Washington. His research includes forest and fire ecology and ecological forestry and silviculture. And uh, since I want to let him, you know, expand upon that, he, he's, he can add more to that, but uh, I guess if you could just uh, give a round of applause and welcome for Andrew. Thank you. Hey, uh, my mic, am I okay? No, I turned it off. He's shaking his head at me. We're good? Go, yeah. Stay right here. Okay. All right. I can't move. Well, thanks for having me, uh, uh, Jason, and for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming uh, this morning. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some new work that we've just recently published, uh, a big team uh, of us. Uh, I've got the, the list of co-authors and collaborators up here on the screen. I want to give credit especially to my colleague Derek Churchill, who is with the Washington Department of Natural Resources, uh, who's, who's been a real uh, leader with this work, as well as Sean Geronimo, Paul Hesburgh, Jim Lux, Nick Povac, Alina Kanzler, and Van Kane. That's the team of scientists that work together on the research I'm going to share with you today. Um, so, and I guess before I start, I'll just give you, unpack this just a little bit more. The central sort of premise that underpins what I'm presenting here is that fire, more than almost anything else, is what's managing our forest landscapes presently. It's the major footprint that's changing vegetation. Uh, that's, it's the dominant force. And so, you know, what, what we've tried to do with the work I'm going to present today is to bring uh, a little bit of a fresh perspective to following wildfire with active management. And so I'm going to share some, some, some ecological principles to guide treatment design, the types of things that we might do. And then the real meat of it is a framework to help make decisions and prioritization decisions about where we might go on the landscape to do post-fire management. So that's what it's really about. And, you know, uh, Mark did a, uh, you know, we had a great presentation here earlier that really laid out that, that just how fundamental and inevitable and essential wildfire is in western coniferous forest landscapes. And so, you know, there's no need to really belabor that at all. But there's a, a, a phrase that we've already heard a couple of times this morning, this sort of concept of landscape resilience. Uh-oh, is there. You need me to stop? Um, first, can we put this on you? Sure. All right. That's going to work just as well as that there. Okay. Oh, right. wow. All right, now I'm going to shut that one off. This okay. is just that one, not his recording one. Go ahead. Okay. So, I was talking about landscape resilience. That's better? Good. All right. What the heck is landscape resilience? It's part of the natural, national cohesive, cohesive plan. It shows up, but the, the important thing here is the, the, the idea of stabilizing feedbacks. And I'm gonna use that term a lot throughout the talk today, but it's basically the idea that some, some event here, fire, uh, has a, a, a stabilizing or moderating influence on fires and forests into the future. And so the classic example here that illustrates this idea is a frequent surface fire regime, like Ponderosa Pine, where one fire consumes fuels, reduces the amount of potential energy stored, changes stand structures such that the next fire is likely to burn in a way that perpetuates the forest. So that's the idea of a stabilizing feedback. The other place, and I'll talk about this again that we see it, is when fires limit the progression of subsequent fire. So uh, Dr. Finney showed us here recently, are we still struggling? <laughs> With my... We need to turn your mic down just to hear. Okay, well there. come on up. Is there a volume on there? I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> Go ahead and keep presenting, I'll figure it out. Well, <laughs> I can talk quieter, I guess. Is that better? <laughs> I can't talk talk fast and quiet though. Andrew, move your mic down. Maybe I'll be sure. Listen here. 
I'm, I'm so mic'd up that I, I don't even know which one is the one to, to use. How's that? I got three mics here. I feel like I'm at a press conference. That's better. Okay. All right. So stabilizing feedbacks. I'll come back to that in a little bit. And then there's this sort of the practical reality that, uh, that even as we you know, undertake large scale forest restoration, fuel reduction, vegetation management treatments, a lot of times wildfires are, are beating us. They're getting there and managing the landscape before we're able to implement the projects. This is some data from, from my colleague Derek Churchill that shows their major planning areas across eastern Washington over a six year period and then the big yellow blobs there, the big circles, those are areas that before they could finish the planning and get into implementation, wildfire burned through their planning landscape and basically totally reset the initial conditions that they were trying to, to, to plan and analyze and implement treatments in. Now closer to home, you know, this is not just happening in eastern Washington, right? This happens all over the west. Closer to home, here we've got the Rice Ridge Fire uh, that burned through the Center Horse project planning area where there was like five or six years of planning. Uh, Odell's coming back. Just lower your mic a bit. <laughs> I'm going to have them down at my belly button here pretty soon. There you go. Okay. All right. How's that? The oh, the other mic. <laughs> okay. You're going to hear my belly when I'm garbled. Is it this one? Go ahead. Keep going. Okay. Test, go test, test. test. It's not that one. I see our sound expert in the back is shaking his head at me. Oh, my God. <laughs> No, no, just keep going. Just keep rolling. Okay, so I was talking about the Rice Ridge Fire and how after five or almost six years of planning, the record of decision was almost signed and then Rice Ridge gets started and burns her open. <laughs> you could have just told me, hey, move your mic back. Okay, and so what happened then? Well, a bunch of things happened, but I was looking at the Rice Ridge Salvage EA as I was prepping for this talk and one of the things that pops out right in the front page is that it, the, that document, which guided subsequent work, and this is not at all a criticism, I'm trying to illustrate how fires tend to, to really cause us to, to change our focus. And that's one of the things that I want to challenge that idea a little bit with today. After the fire, the Center Horse Project and its analysis was set aside. Okay, that's straight out of the text. And many, the, the document says, many of the proposed beneficial outcomes of that treatment are now foregone. They're, they're not available to us. And essentially, we, we you know, pivoted into uh, a post-fire management approach that just you know, gave up, I'll say, on what, there, what was trying to be accomplished before the fire occurred. And, and now the, the priority was, well, let's get some economic value out of this. Uh, let's focus on hazard reduction getting hazard trees out of developed sites, out of road corridors, and let's identify places to plant to reestablish forest. So I, I guess I, I would say that if you crosswalk those objectives with the pre-fire objectives that it's spent five plus years uh, designing and managing towards, there's not a huge amount of overlap. But I would make the case that there probably is more overlap if we went and looked for it. And that's really what this is, the, the, these ideas are about. So to wrap up this sort of background and motivation, as, as we all in this room already do, we know we have to expect wildfires. They're coming, they're, they're in, and it's, it's inevitable. And the idea that I want to put forward here is, can we use wildfires or some portion of them to meet our management objectives, especially those goals that we might have for landscape resilience? And then how do we actually do that? Is it possible and how do we do that? So, so the team that I introduced at the start here, uh, you know, we spent the better part of, I don't know, almost five years working on that question in a research project. And so I'm trying to present now some of the things that have come out of that. And, uh, I'm getting confused by my slides here. So there's two major pieces that, um, that I'll talk about later as we move through the day. So one is taking a landscape scale, a really large spatial scale approach to assessing the effects or the work that the wildfires accomplished. So thinking almost a little bit about wildfires is like an incredibly 
uh, unruly uh, uh, and efficient at treating acres, you know, sort of operator or, or, or manager out there on the landscape. And then after that analysis, drawing on uh, your assessment of the landscape, the work that the fire did, and some ecological principles to develop a prioritization for where we might go to do post-fire work and what that work might look like. So the, the two papers that I'm gonna really draw heavily on uh, here, you can, you know, if this is interesting to you, we can, I can provide them, they're easy to find on the internet, but a lot of the case studies and information that I'm drawing on today are captured in these two papers. Uh, and I can, you know, circle up with me uh, if you'd like to get your hands on those. So I'm gonna start with a set of five principles that we introduced, and this is, you know, th this is pretty straightforward stuff here, and, it, and one of the things I wanna emphasize it, is that these principles, these sort of ecological concepts that we wanna to bring to post-fire management, they are really scale invariant, which means that if you're doing post-fire management in a 20-acre stand or a 20,000-acre landscape, you can draw on and apply these. So a lot of the later part of the talk, I'm gonna be focused at really big spatial scales, but, but these are things that, you know, you, it's sort of a, t a tool that doesn't uh, really depend on how big a patch of ground you're working with. The first one is, is just thinking about the really difficult to replace parts and pieces. And the one that jumps out, of course, is large diameter trees and large diameter wood. You know, it takes centuries to produce a tree of that size, and they do all sorts of, of, of different functions that can't be replicated by having a bunch of little trees of equivalent biomass. And so when we've got these still on the landscape, we wanna treat them with you know, an extra degree of, I'll say, protection and retention, and keep those that you still have after the fire around. The other th element that, that we really wanna focus on for giving some measure of protection as we go into managing a post-fire environment are refugia, so places the fire didn't visit within the burn footprint. Now, now sometimes we're gonna go in and if there's big patches of it within the burn footprint, we may actually, and you'll hear me say this later, we, we may choose to go do work there. But I'm thinking at sort of sm smaller scales and especially in places where these fire refugia are associated with landscape features where you maybe don't wanna have a lot of fire there. So wet places, for example, or uh, places up high uh, in the stand replacement regimes where you have organisms like, say, for example, Canada lynx that prefer uh, a, a complex multi-story stand structure and that we know as they move through big burned landscapes, they tend to gravitate toward and use patches like these un unburned refugia I'm showing here on the landscape. So we've seen this uh, uh, having an effect all the way down to a few square feet of unburned patches within, uh, within a forest stand where you've got understory plants or seedlings or you know, whatever it might be that's persisted through the fire that now is a source of propagules of plants and, and organisms to colonize into the burned landscape up to larger scales like that. So the second thing is thinking ahead now and thinking about, okay, we've had a fire, that fire may have killed a bunch of biomass, and at some point that biomass is gonna come down out of the canopy and be trans trans transferred onto the forest floor where it's gonna become woody fuels first and then with time contribute to the litter and duff fuel bed. And so thinking about, okay, we, we've, we've, we've changed the fuels immediately with consumption during the fire, but as you look over a five, 10, 15 year time horizon into the future, what does that mean for future fuel accumulation? And one of the things when we're looking at forest where it's been a long time since fire last visited, those first entry fires actually generate quite a bit of fuel. And I'm trying to illustrate that with this graph here where you can see the X, the X axis is time, years, and you can see the biomass of snags going down and the biomass of woody fuels on the forest floor going up through time. So if we wanna have some sort of influence on the trajectory of fuel accumulation over the next couple of decades, that's something that we need to give some attention to. And as we think about especially climate change, and, and drier environments that are gonna be, have longer periods of extended opportunities to burn going forward. Thinking about 
do we have a site where I want to deliberately begin to transition from a longer interval fire regime to a shorter interval fire regime? And what does that mean for managing the fuels through time? that have been generated by the fire, the, the fire we're looking at right now. And one of the things that comes out of this is that the, you might begin to identify some places where you want to go manage on your post-fire landscape to have an influence on the trajectory of fuel accumulation over time. Now what directly follows from this piece is thinking about the next fire and the, initi or the reinitiation or the maintenance of these stabilizing feedbacks. And so one of the questions that we need to ask when a fire burns through our landscape is where did that fire either maintain or reinitiate a stabilizing feedback? And Dr. Finney showed us toward the end of his talk some, some landscape views of where big fire had burned through recently burned with prescribed fire areas. That's what I'm talking about where the, the, the fire has maintained that stabilizing feedback and sort of basically added value to the prescribed fire or the, the thinning and fuel reduction treatment that you had done in the past before the fire got there. So this is a place where you're probably not going to want to go do anything because the fire's just bought you some time, but it can become a landscape feature that you can, that you can sort of add to and expand from. And then looking down the road, you know, okay, I'm going to have to be thinking about coming back here 10, 15, 20 years out. But this is where fire bought you some time. This is just the, the other side of the stabilizing feedback idea here where uh, in a higher severity fire regime, what you see there is, is the polygons on the map are, are different fires and the years are associated with them. And you can see here where one fire is burning up to a fire that burned a few years ago, and you can see the inhibition of spread from one to the next. So this is, this is that same idea where you, we're not having huge blobs on this landscape where the fire bumps into where it was just before. All right, now switching gears a little bit, and again, thinking about the future and thinking about our scarce resources that we have to available to manage in the post-fire landscape. Here, you know, we've got a monster high severity patch, long ways to any seed source, but to make any sort of informed decision about where we might spend our time and effort putting seedlings back in the ground here in a reforestation strategy, the first thing that we need to do is say, what part of this landscape is gonna be climate limited? where it's just not likely to support a forest going into the future. And then the other side of that is what part of this landscape is, is suitable to continue to support forests, but there's no seed source. So we need to overcome the seed source limitation. And I'll come back to this later on. And then the fifth principle here is aligning species composition and forest structure with our future fire regimes and climate, with how we think things are gonna be over the next several decades. And so as you're making decisions about planting in the landscape like that, we also might be making decisions about what do we want to deliberately change the species composition to in anticipation of what we expect the climate to be like going forward. And then the same thing on structure. So after that fire is burned, thinking about, okay, what, what, do, what do I want my relationship between forest structure and fire to look like going forward? And is there a need for me to go in there and begin to basically finish the job that, that the wildfire started? And some, some examples of that might be places where you had really low severity and you actually didn't achieve the sort of mortality that maybe you'd like to have, or maybe you need, want to do something to manage your surface fuels, like I already mentioned. So those are some generalizable principles. One of the, I think the frustrating things about these sort of principles is it doesn't tell you anything about how to apply them. It's like, okay, fine. You know, some academic says this is what to do. So that's frustrating. They're scale invariant, so you can choose where to apply them. Uh, but let's zoom out to the landscape scale. And I think this is a, really the kind of the interesting part of the process here. So. One of the challenges, I think, with doing work in a burned landscape is that it's rare to, to, to be able to go, especially I'm thinking about when you have, for example, public stakeholders. It's rare that we find good examples 
I would say, well, of, of a proposal that says, well, this is the ecological rationale that I, the manager, am drawing on to propose this work. And, and we're very good, at, and it's very appropriate to, to clearly articulate our economic objectives, our hazard reduction objectives, our reforestation objectives. We're, we're, we're excellent at that. But where, and this is why we did this work, where the literature doesn't provide a lot of guidance is what's the ecological rationale for doing work in a burned landscape? And so that's the kind of the void that we're trying to fill here. And there are sort of two tools uh, that I will put forward today. One is this idea of a post-fire landscape analysis. So basically zooming out to the five to 50,000 acre scale and asking the question, how did the fire change structure and, and vegetation type across these large landscapes, and how does that align with my, either my goals or some sort of reference information that gives me a sense of, do I have too much or too little of different conditions that then give me a basis for making decisions about what types of treatments to do and where I might do them. But you can boil this down, I think, to sort of three fundamental questions. So where did, the, where did this wildfire maintain conditions and buy time in a fire-prone landscape where you basically don't have to worry about this part of the landscape for a period of time? Where did the fire make progress towards your management objectives? But it, but it needs some help to finish the job. A lot of times that's gonna be places where you have relatively low to moderate severity effects in a long fire, fire free or fire excluded initial condition. And then of course, we need to identify where fire overshot and did things that we don't like and has created a new management issue for us where we need to uh, uh, basically address the over the, and, the, and correct some of those issues. Now this slide here, this is actually really really new. This is something that, that in the papers that we just published this earlier this winter, we didn't have any sort of a timeline in there, thinking really deliberately about, okay, what's the sequence and what are the temporal windows that we need to be thinking about? And as folks have started to apply this, and Derek did this, all, this, this winter with his team at the, DN, at the DNR in, in Washington, when they started to apply these tools, they realized, you know, we need to chunk up some of these principles and some of the analysis into discrete windows and really focus on, well, obviously, you got to do your analysis first. And that's got to start basically while it's still smoking, while, you know, like the fire is just out. Being successful means that you've got the data and the staff and the and the basically the things that you need to analyze fire effects and how that fire changed your landscape as quickly as possible so that you can really in the first you know few months to maybe year and a half get those those time dependent actions in place and implemented in an efficient way. And so we've started to begin to think about, okay, in our post-fire management framework, what do we need to prioritize in the first few months, first few years, and then looking out more in the five to 10 year horizon. So step one, we gotta figure out what, what did the fire do for us? So what does that involve? It involves obtaining some early fire severity data. So very early season of, uh, we want to have good data that characterizes future climatic water deficits. So basically that's a measure of drought stress and, and we have you know, very good maps of climatic water deficit now and you can take climate change forecasts and, and translate those maps and basically update them to say, to say like this is how much drought stress different places on the landscape will experience we, we think 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. And that's really important in helping us think, okay, what kind of seedlings do I want to put in the ground here? Or what sort of structure do I want to be managing for? Knowing that conditions are going to be different in 20, 30, 40 years. And then we need to have some sense of, you know, we can take the fire severity data, combine that with the pre-fire inventory or structure data, and we have now an estimate of, of the fire effects on forest structure and composition. And then we take that and do some sort of a departure analysis. And all that is, is a, 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 an analysis that says, here's my current condition, here's an estimate of what I, what, my, what I would like my condition to be or what I think my targets are. And there are lots of ways to get at that. You can use HRV, 
FRV, you know, historical or future range of variability reference data. You can use modeling studies. Or you can just say, this is what I want my landscape to look like. And you can do that entirely through a social process. Like, you know, but the point is, is to have some sort of a benchmark that you're comparing your conditions to, to set your targets. I mean, it's, it's, it's very much what Dr. Finney was getting at at the end, of basically define of his presentation, defining your objectives, and then you know, using that to inform what we're gonna do. Okay, so I'm gonna illustrate this, these ideas, with a couple of case studies that we, that we included in this paper. And so there are two different watersheds. These are in north, uh, north central, northeastern Washington. That's just you know, where, where we did this study. It, it would work, you know, it works anywhere. Um, but Benson Creek, you can see it on the inset map here. It's kind of north central on the Okanagan Wenatchee. Scatter Creek is a little bit more in the northeast on the Colville National Forest. And these blobs on the map, those are the, the watershed, the, the sort of the unit of analysis uh, that we took here. They're about, I think both of these were in the sort of like seven to 9,000 acre size. Uh, so that gives you a sense of how big of the, uh, the area on the map is there. Now the top, the top row here is projected deficit at around mid-century, around 2055. And we've just been this up. And so deficit is given basically how hot it is there in the soil conditions, how much unmet evaporative demand is there. So how much water would the plants like to have that they, that they aren't getting? And so it's a very useful measure of, of mapping, sort of combining uh, climate data with topography data to get a sense across your landscape. How dry is it or how, how moist is the landscape? And we've been this up and you can see the gray areas on the map. Those are places where looking into the middle of the century, it's probably unlikely that we're gonna be able to support much forest vegetation there anymore. So very high, it's, it's a drought stress environment that's more in line with grasslands and shrub step and shrublands. And then at the other end, you see the blues and greens right here that are, that are unsurprisingly there towards the bottom of the slopes, down in the, in, the, in the draws and on the northeast aspects. Those are places that are gonna still have relatively lower moisture stress as we go forward. So we've got that sort of, sort of biophysical data and then combine that with the information on the bottom row, that's the burn severity data. And then we need to combine that with some sort of a characterization of pre-fire and post-fire structure. And there's lots and lots of ways to get there. I'm not gonna go into any of the details on that. You basically, you, you use the data you have available. And so the, there's no one way to, to get this. But what, here what we've done is classified forest structure into major groups. So the pink is open conditions. And then we've got, you know, basically a gradient of tree size from small, medium, large, crossed with degree of canopy openness, open to closed canopy. And you can see, you know, the pre-fire conditions are in the top row, and then the post-fire conditions are in the bottom row. So at this point, we've got the raw data to characterize the fire effects, to characterize how it changed the structure across the landscape, and now what we need to do is conduct some sort of departure analysis that basically asks the question, how does my post-fire landscape line up with you know, what we think is sort of appropriate or normal or what we want at this same scale? And so here what we did is took a, a set of data from watersheds in the same uh, climate environment, so the same general environmental conditions, and used a historical air photo interpretation to construct uh, uh, historical range of variability envelopes. And that's on this graph right here, uh, over here on the right-hand side, the ranges that you see of the green and the yellow stripes, those are our, our estimates of how much of the landscape was in forest, was in woodland, shrubland, and so on. And then the tick marks show uh, the pre-fire condition and then the arrow shows the movement caused by fire and the post-fire condition. And so this is just a very sort of coarse way of one capturing at this watershed scale, what did the fire do? How much change? What was the direction of that change? And did it push, did it keep us inside of our, our range of variability or did it push us outside of our range of variability? And so here, like if we focus in on, on herblands here, 
you can see the fire had the effect of pushing it way outside of the entire range of variability of all of our, you know, half a dozen or dozen or so other reference data sets to compare to. So that's telling us that, wow, fire really did push us kind of outside of the norm here for this cover type. Although if we look at forests, I think it's interesting that even though this was a very severe fire, we're still well within the range of HRV and FRV. And I should explain here real quickly what, how we derive FRV. Basically, the FRV bands are going to the set of warmer, drier reference watersheds that our current than our current ones are and comparing to that to that set so it's basically saying that we're going to look at places that now are warmer and drier and, and use that as sort of a climate change analog uh, comparison going forward so uh, same thing here but now i'm showing forest structure classes and so this is looking just at the forested portion of the landscape and we've got different structure classes, so large closed, large open, so on and so forth. And you can see the magnitude and direction, the change that it caused. What's kind of surprising to me is that we're, we stay inside the ranges here on almost all of these things, although we get pretty close to the edges. And then this is some data that characterizes patch size. So, uh, and what you can, so the, the, the gray shaded area on this figure is the sort of the natural range of variability of all of the different reference watersheds. And you can see patch size on a logarithmic axis here going from 10, 100 up to 10,000 hectares. And then cumulative percent of the landscape on the y-axis. And our pre-fire condition is the solid line and the post-fire condition is the dashed line. And so what you can see here is the dashed line shifted to the right. And what that's telling us is that the fire uh, transform this landscape from having a lot of small and medium-sized patches to having just a few giant patches. So we, you know, summer, I've kind of already said this, but summering is all of this. The, this fire had just extreme, extraordinary effects, and it created this huge open patch, totally changed the patch size distribution. And, you know, what really stands out is areas in the medium and large tree size classes, those are the ones that are really low relative to our reference data set that we want to kind of perhaps focus on. And we do the same thing for Scatter Creek. Here, I'll run through it a little bit quicker. So here, uh, the fire pushed our percent forest landscape out of the historical range of variability, but we're right, you know, right in the middle of the future range of variability. So you can see those changes there across veg type. And then when we look at structure conditions, you know, for example, here are large closed. We're outside of the HRV and almost outside of the future range of variability. Same thing for medium open, we're, we've pushed out of the range for both of those conditions. So what this departure analysis is doing for us is helping us take a really big picture view and think, okay, what did the fire do for us in terms of changing the relative abundance of different structure types and putting it in an even larger context of saying, okay, regionally, how does that then fit into, you know, what this environment, you know, should or we think should, should normally support? So it begins to give us a basis for saying, well, maybe I want to do something to change post-fire medium open and maybe our large closed or large open structure type abundances across the landscape. So it's developing a rationale to do work post fire. Here, this is that same you know, patch size distribution. This one goes in the opposite direction. So this was a lower severity fire and the, the landscape was already pretty fragmented. And here the fire moved it into the move the landscape into an even more fragmented condition where the mean patch size uh, went down. So we started with a condition that was already hard, uh, uh, fragmented in this landscape and depleted of big trees. The fire further fragmented it and we've got some some patch types and structure classes that are sort of outside of our our targets I'll say or out, definitely outside of the reference conditions. All right. So at this point, all we've really done is analyze fire effects. So now, the, what we'd like to be able to do is to combine some of those principles, those big picture ideas, 
with the analysis of the effects of the fire across the landscape to develop a post-fire landscape prescription or treatment prioritization. And this, this took us, I mean, this is actually, uh, this is actually really hard, and there are many, many ways to do this. And so I'm going to show you how we approached it. Uh, but, you know, depending on the data that you have and how you want to go about it, there are lots of ways to get to this same basic outcome. But the way that we approached it was that we said, okay, we're going we're gonna to carve our landscape up into categories that reflect the combination of the post-fire condition and that integrate our, our sort of principles, our management principles that, we've, that we're using to, to guide what we're going to do in this landscape. And so here's this list of seven different things. And so I'll just run through them really quickly. The first is uh, let's identify the places in this landscape we don't think are going to support forest in the future. Because that's going to help us, you know, just right away, you know, scale back on what we need to worry about. And then next, let's identify the dispersal limited places. After that, let's identify the structurally complex residual forest patches that are located in places that we expect to stay relatively moist and that might be fire or disturbance refugia in the future. And those are places that we probably don't want to do a whole lot with. And maybe what we want to do is work around them to give them a little bit more protection. And we go on through the list here. So when we start to apply this across these landscapes, I'm gonna sort of step through sort of a, a, a little bit more of an illustrated process to thinking about this. So this photo, let me, can you see my cursor? I don't think it comes up on there. So this picture is in Benson Creek, and it's one of the big high severity patches on a southwest facing slope. And it's in sort of one of the gray areas here. Oh, sorry, this guy. That picture is in the Benson Creek watershed, and it's on a really high deficit environment. And so these are places, you know, this whole big slope facet we're looking at, where it's not like, even though there were trees there before the fire, they were sort of hanging out. They were adult trees with big, deep established root systems, but going forward, it's, it's unlikely that we're gonna have much successful tree regeneration here. And so the fire has effectively converted this place to what's gonna be a grassland in the future. And so we think about what we might do here. This is a relatively low priority. You might wanna go do economic salvage there if, if the operating situation makes sense, and, but uh, you probably just wanna prioritize that pretty low. Now what about high severity patches? And they're on places where future deficit is projected to stay low. So we're gonna have moisture going forward. And there's pretty close to a seed source. They're within, you know, about 500 feet of live seed sources. So those are places where tree regeneration is not likely to be, be limited. So we probably don't need to prioritize this sort of environment for post-fire planting. And you may not want to really prioritize it a lot other than evaluating, okay, is the condition here set up so that as the next stand develops, it's, it's the composition and structure that we're likely to get is gonna be aligned with our future climate and fire regimes. But there, in many cases, this is gonna be a relatively low priority environment. And then if we look at something like this, so here I'm trying to illustrate super high severity patches, really depleted seed sources, but it's in an environment that's still gonna support trees. There's enough moisture here that it's gonna support trees into the future. But the problem is that we're not gonna have any natural regeneration. So this is a place that we might wanna really prioritize early after fire to do planting and maybe combine that with post-fire salvage with an eye towards managing our future fuel accumulations on that site. Now, if we switch to the other end of the fire severity gradient, one of the first things we can do is say, okay, let's find those unburned and low, you know, low severity patches that also are in environments that are conducive to the multi-story structure and maybe fire uh, protected from, from fire uh, and identify them because we're interested with them, but they're probably not gonna be a high priority for post-fire management. You know, maybe you want to, 
think about treating the surrounding landscape and thinking about, you know, for example, edge hardening, actions that you might be able to take to make it harder for a future fire to get into that environment because these are now rarer in your post-fire environment than they were before. This is like your, your remaining large tree complex structure. So we, we not necessarily gonna wanna do anything in it, but perhaps around it. This is, uh, so staying focused now on the, on the low and moderate severity part of the landscape, you know, one of the analyses that, that this involves is intersecting the recent past treatments, especially the recent past prescribed fire treatments, with the fire footprint to find places where our wildfire was likely to have, to have functioned as a stabilizing feedback. And you can see this here, this picture from uh, the bootleg fire last year, where the green stripe here in the middle of the picture, that's where the bootleg fire burned through a recently thinned and burned, prescribed burned area. And you can see, well, the, the forest there persisted. And the work that the wildfire did was to further redu reduce surface fuels, continue to elevate the base, the, the base of the live crown and maintain that as a forest. So that patch right there is gonna be a relatively low priority for post-fire management, but it gives us an anchor point on the landscape for thinking about, okay, are there things that I wanna prioritize in the adjacent areas? And then finally, at a higher priority are places like this. So the low and moderate severity portions of the landscape where fire started the job, but maybe needs some help to finish that job. And so identifying places where you might want to post fire, not only do salvage, but, but as well as green tree thinning to achieve your stand density uh, objectives and to manage future fuel accumulations. So, you know, identifying and differentiating places where fire stabilized things for you or where fire started the job but needs some help finishing the job, I think is one of the big, one of the really big changes here uh, that comes out of the, the, the framework that we've put forward. And it, it might be that in a lot of cases, your post-fire management opportunities, a lot of these environments are gonna light up. Okay, so when we work through that sort of a process in an analytical sense, you know, doing this in a GIS framework, these are the, the maps that fall out of that process for our two study landscapes. And you know, in the Benson Creek landscape, it's this very high deficit, droughty, marginal forest environment, and all of that red that you see, that's climate limited. Those are the places that you don't, probably wouldn't even wanna waste your time there. Instead, what you wanna, focus on is communicating to your stakeholders, hey, this isn't gonna be forest in the future. And, and, and you know, doing the sort of me, you know, messaging and communications work to help your stakeholders get comfortable with that transition that's, that's happening. And instead, finding places on that landscape where we can still do work to maintain the forest condition. And so what that looks like here is, you know, prioritizing planting founder tree populations on, you know, in simple terms, it's gonna be on wet sites, north and east aspects, in the dispersal limited areas where we, we know we're gonna have an issue with, um, with post-fire regeneration. And then here, this is the other, I think, sort of surprising thing that may come out of these sorts of analyses is that if you wanna maintain forest structure in this watershed, you probably want to prioritize treating the green portion, the unburned corner down here uh, in this particular landscape, because that's where the vast majority of the remaining medium and large tree structure is. Fire didn't get in there, and, and it hasn't been there for a long time, so it's a priority now for, for finishing the job at the landscape scale with, with fuel reduction and prescribed fire treatments to come out of that. And we can go through a similar sort of exercise on Scatter Creek. Here it was different. We had a lot of, of, you see these big purple blobs. There was a lot of relatively recent harvest and prescribed fire in parts of this landscape. And the fire burned through that at relatively low severity. And so quite a few of those places are now in our sort of stabilizing feedback condition. And instead, what that points towards is focusing around those areas where you can do that, that work sort of finishing the job 
and blocking up the fragmented parts of the landscape. Okay, in the last few minutes here, I want to give you just a quick look at um, the Cedar Creek fire over on the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest where these ideas were, were rolled out. So Derek and his team at DNR uh, provided some analytical, I don't know, assistance to the forest uh, in taking their immediate post-fire data and trying to help do the sorts of analyses that I've described to you here. And, you know, we had, the data that I've been presenting, you know, we had, you know, years. We weren't under the, t under the gun of, like, actually trying to, you know, get this done and roll it out and implement it before all the value was gone from the trees or whatever that we were trying to, to, to work with. And so this is, you know, a first look at trying to do this after a real fire. So uh, some quick look at the data. So a lot of this fire... You burned with, I don't know, pretty reasonable effects, but when you look at the dry forest, in this particular case, there was a lot more high severity in the dry forests in this landscape, in this fire event, than there were historically. And you can see that, like in this sort of an image right here, where, you know, they're likely to have some post-fire regenerations uh, issues in this environment, where it's already relatively dry and marginal, and now you've got really big distances to any green, green forest, in potential seed sources. But then there are other big chunks of this environment where the fire burned at pretty moderate to low severity and it had the effect of you know, reducing surface and ladder fuels, thinning the canopy, but it's also created a big pulse of future wood and future fuel that you may want to do some basically finish up work with right now. And so I'll show you the same sort of figures here. You can see what this fire did in terms of pushing the amount of forest in this watershed outside of the HRV, it's still squarely in the future range of variability, increasing woodland, gives you a sense that there's a little bit of, of alignment opportunity that we might have here with post-fire management. And then, you know, thinking about how can we quickly carve the landscape up into high and low severity environments and identify, okay, what are the climate limited portions, what are the dispersal limited portions, and where do we quickly need to uh, identify those environments as priority for post-fire management. And so what that looks like on the map, so here I'll just give you one focus looking at the high severity regions. So here, within this watershed of an, uh, uh, that was analyzed, you know, what pops out of this analysis is, you know, some bright spots on the map where you have high severity effects, long distance to seed source, but even in this dry forest, future deficit is projected to still support so forest. And so those are places that, especially, and then we lay on top of that some operational screens like distance from road to quickly prioritize what are places that probably need our help with post-fire management, that we can effectively and efficiently get to uh, and allocate those resources in a, in, a, in a deliberate, ecologically justified way. And then looking at the other side here, looking at the, the moderate and low severity portions of the landscape. So where do we want to finish the job that wildfire started for us? And so we're in the moderate to low severity bend, but, but prioritizing the higher severity patches of uh, portions of that places where you had really high pre-fire cover and stand density where you're likely to have a lot of biomass that you'd like to do something with uh, in thinking about both sort of finishing the job fire started and managing those fuels into the future. Okay, so I'll just wrap up here and leave us hopefully five minutes to talk about some of this stuff. So after you know, the five years that we've spent trying to work on these ideas in, in one winter of some folks beginning to apply these, you know, one of the things that's been clear throughout is that there's demand for this sort of thing. Especially, in, I see it with the public, where you know, we've gotten very good at explaining and there's a huge scientific literature that underpins forest management. But we haven't done as much in the post-fire environment. And so I see a lot of demand for that. So that's exciting. We know we need to move fast. And so, you know, building out the data and the processing pipelines or even just the relationships with, uh, you know, organizations that can do that for you quickly is key. And those things are already falling. So when we started this, we were, we were overwhelmed by the technological side of things. 
And now it's the technology is not really limiting anymore. You know, we can get the data, acquire the data, do the math quick enough that that's really not very limiting anymore. And so what's what's more limiting now is engaging with the organizations, with your processes, procedures, policy to make this work and this analysis and come to decisions in a really quick uh, and timely manner. And so I think that's, that's gonna be the next set of barriers that will, uh, that will fall. But in any case, this, um, I don't know, hopefully some of this stuff is useful. Uh, I, what, I, what I would predict and what I hope is that uh, if you see something useful here, you're probably gonna have to adapt it. And that's usually where we see the best success is when you know, folks are like, well, yeah, these I kind of see how to do this, but you know, to apply it in my landscape or with my data or my, da my tools, I'm gonna have to do it a little bit differently. And I, I just wanna say that I want you to do that. And if I can help you do that or, or connect you with people to do that, you know, adapting ideas or completely turning them on their head is great. So this is not about like, this is how to do it. Please don't take that away from it. But I think the managing in the post-fire environment and bringing a, a different set of analyses to bear on that, to justify and prioritize the things that we choose to do or propose to do, has got a lot to offer. And so, you know, this is one way that we've approached it, and there's probably gonna be a whole lot of better ways that you all will come up with to applying these ideas. So with that, I think I'm out of slides. Thank you for the opportunity to present, and hopefully we've got a few minutes for questions. We've got about four minutes for questions, All right. and I'll try to just call on people. So Frank, go ahead and fire off, and then maybe you can just repeat it a little yep. bit so that we all know what the question was. Definitely. So, there goes. Uh, how or was post fire bug outbreaks figured into the equation? That's a great question. No, uh, we didn't. We didn't model that. You could that we know enough about tree mortality post fire and how that plays out over like a five year timeline that you could build that in uh, to, to some, some I, can, I could see a pathway to that. We didn't explicitly build that into our analysis, but that's a great question, especially like we know like with Douglas fir, for example, like you, you really tend to get a, a, a bump and post fire beetle cause mortality targets the big trees uh, oftentimes, and we could build that into the planning pipeline. Awesome question. Yeah, a lot of times you see where you've got those little islands that were left that didn't get burned, and mm -hmm. the beetles finish the job for you. Uh huh. And sometimes those can be as large as the original fire. Mm hmm. Well, so the, I I agree with you. What do you think, though, about, so given what we know about post fire bark beetles and how, you know, like if we focus on Douglas fir, you know, one of the reasons why the populations go up is they've got a uh, higher probability of reproductive success. You got a bunch of injured trees or recently killed trees where they can have higher brood survival. So if you're able to manage some portion of your post-fire landscape and reduce the abundance of that suitable material, you might have an effect on your post-fire beetle cause mortality. Yeah. And that, when I say, you know, finish the job piece of it, let me just back up. You know, that sort of environment, these are all pines here, but imagine a bunch of dug fir. I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I, I, I'm using my crystal ball now, but if you're able to do some, some salvage work here, finish the job, have a post-fire stand structure that you like, you, you, I, I would predict that you're likely to have some effect maybe on the beetles. Now the challenge, I guess I'll be realistic. If you've got a 100,000 acre fire, and we only have the capacity to do maybe 5,000 acres of post-fire treatment, maybe we're not gonna have that big of an effect. So I don't wanna over-promise, but <laughs> your, your point is well taken. And yes? How soon after a fire, is, it, is all this data pumped out by the USFS after every single fire? So when you're doing restoration on private lands, uh, after a fire, it'd be pretty helpful to have something like this for Management. So, does this, does this come out after every fire? 
So a lot of the data is available after the fire. Like that fire severity map there is a, um, well, let's see, they have the product labeled DNR GEE. I don't even know what that stands for, but there's, there's satellite based, I think it's ravage data is the term that come, that's available very early after fire. Tends to be pretty noisy and can change. Uh, the other thing, so you have that. I think I'm gonna punt on your question and say that what we need to get better at is making wall-to-wall -wall post fire data available across all lands quickly and i think a lot of that capacity is there it's i think relatively disorganized in most jurisdictions um, but that's something that i think that we need to work towards and it's a it, it is a barrier you know when i said that you know the technology cha challenges were what were overwhelming to us when we started the project I think that's one of the things that's still going to limit folks doing this, especially if you're not the Forest Service or maybe a big, well-funded state agency that has, you know, in-house scientists and in-house data sets and analysts to really drive this. But, um, you know, that capacity is there and that expertise is there. And so if we can just get them to run it for the whole state or the whole fire footprint, suddenly those things will be, become available. All right, All right. This on. well, thank you very much. We're out of time, and we Good. do have a token of our appreciation for you oh, coming here. Thank so, you. Yeah, I one more time. It.